Hello and welcome to your go-to Detroit Pistons podcast, The Pistons Pulse, co-hosted by me, Bryce Simon of Motor City Hoops, a former D1 Hooper and current teacher, husband, and father of three amazing kids. And I'm Omari Sanko for the second Pistons beat writer for the Detroit Free Press. And of course, we're blessed to always be joined by our producer, Wes Davenport. And today we have a very special guest, one that goes all the way back to the Motor City Hoops days. I am proud and happy to call this man a friend in my real life as well. We have Richard Stamen at Mavs Draft on Twitter. If you're not following him, you should be. He has a sub sack putting out all of his draft content. And then, of course, you can listen to him on Locked On Big Board. Rich, Richard, whatever we want to call you, I guess. <laughs> what is up? I'm sorry. The inside joke before the show, I was like, man, I call him Richard. Everybody else calls him Rich. I'm an awful friend. Richard, what's up? How you doing today? Hey, first of all, thank you for that intro. I gotta, I gotta have y'all everywhere I go because this is that was a hype man level good. Like I appreciate that. Yeah, no, Bryce is a great hype man. I'll give him that. Like the enthusiasm <laughs> is there. Like he really gasses you up. Like it's really good. <laughs> That's why everybody thinks I'm like 25 years old, and then they see me and I'm bald, and it's like, oh, you don't look the way I thought you were gonna look whenever I only heard your voice. I can't tell you how many times that's happened in the last. Three or four weeks or three or four months. I'm like, what is going on? I didn't. So it's funny. I, I recorded on a Thunder podcast recently and that dude, Dylan, like hyped me up. It was like, it, I almost got embarrassed because he just like doing all these things. I'm like, please stop. Now, uh, you know, I'm blushing, but we're excited to have Richard here. We're going to go through as many of these prospects at the top as we can. Richard is a NBA draft expert. And so maybe we'll even talk some pick number 53 and some of those things as well. But Omari, Last time we recorded, we were able to talk about Trajan Langdon. Since then, oh, real quick from Jared Stormer, my first time being able to catch one of these lives. You all do great work. Thank you so much. We appreciate appreciate it. Please enjoy this. If you haven't been here, drop questions in the comments for Richard, whoever will get to those. But we have not talked to Troy Weaver News. So Amari, for anybody who doesn't, I'll let you kind of report on that, cook on that, give your thoughts. I'll give some quick thoughts. And then I know Richard has some thoughts on that as well. And then we'll get into NBA draft. No doubt. Not a whole lot to add from the reporting from last week, but Pistons have officially moved on from Trey Weaver. And of course, they hired Trajan Langman officially last week as well. So it's been a official passing of the torch. You know, I don't think we necessarily need to recap <laughs> the last four years in any sense. You know, I think the only thing I will say is that it wasn't just Troy. You know, like I, like I think last season was an organizational thing and they're going to have to really you know, put their trust in, you know, Trajan and then to get to get this thing going. You know, I like I don't think it's fair for Trey to take the entire brunt of the 14 win record. But at the same time, we have a season like that. Obviously there has to be some some change. So, you know, good luck to Trey, whatever's next for you. And we'll see what's up for Trajan Langdon. Also, I wrote a feature on Trajan that ran in the paper uh, yesterday. I just talked to people around the league who have worked with him previously. And uh, if you want some insight on who Trajan is as a person, I recommend you check that out without any bias. (laughs) Thank you, everybody that's here with us live. What's up? Hey, what up, though? Like all of that. Appreciate you guys. My quick thoughts is like, I think the writing was on the wall here, right? Whenever you create a new position that is above the current general manager and is going to have full control, most likely, unless there's just some like overarching pre-existing relationship between Trajan and Troy Weaver, th- this was probably what was going to happen. I don't blame Troy Weaver for wanting to get out. You know, the reports were that maybe there was some offer to stay around. Hey, you guys are looking for an offsite scout. I will throw my name in the hat. Detroit Pistons front office. Trajan hit me up. Both fathers of three. We got some some stuff going on there. Real quick, Amari, before we get Richard's thoughts. I did have somebody ask, I know you've been asked this, any clue on a press conference for Trajan Langdon? Anything, you have any idea about that? No. No, I'm like, it'll, he, like he will have one. He will have one. I don't know what it's going to be, but he will have one. So. I just, I told a, a listener, a loyal listener that I would ask. And so I wanted to follow through. Richard, um, you text me as soon as this news came out. You are a non-biased, you are not a Pistons fan. You follow, if you are a fan of anybody, it's the Mavericks and or the Magic. What are your thoughts on Trajan Langdon, Troy Weaver getting moved, like all of this in general from an outsider's perspective? Yeah, I, it's really hard to believe that Troy Weaver wasn't here longer because it feels like a lot of this stuff has been going back so far. I mean, one of his first moves was after the 2020 draft, he traded Bruce Brown for Zanon Musa, who was immediately waived, if I'm not mistaken. I think Jalen Hands also is part of that trade. So two guys that never even touched an NBA floor, really, like after that trade, 
And then also you guys are still paying the price for the Isaiah Stewart trade. Like there's a lot out as Omari. I think you were the one that told me that at the combine that you opened my eyes up to that. <laughs> and there's just yeah. so many different things with that where I was, I, I just feel like he got such a long leash for somebody who he got Cade Cunningham and they seemingly got worse after getting the number one pick. And I, I feel like that was just the biggest red flag possible. Yeah. No, and I think what's what's interesting is that at this point last year, like if you said, hey, like, you know, the Pistons are going to have the worst season of all time and, you know, the GM will be out this and that, like nobody would have believed you. And, you know, I still think it's something to put into context just how quickly things collapsed last season. No, you typically don't see that. But that's sort of just looking back at the entire deal, that's kind of what sticks out in my mind now. Like, wow, like things changed really, really, really quickly. And up until... This past year, I think there was always some cr- criticism for the job he did just because of the records, but there was also a certain benefit of the doubt. So that just shows how tricky it is to, you know, build teams in the NBA. And yeah, we'll see what Trajan brings up. Listen, I will finish it off with this. I think Sam Bassini said it best whenever we were talking about it months ago. It, Troy Weaver was essentially a death by a thousand cuts. There, there's not necessarily one individual move where you're like, oh my gosh, that's a fireable offense. But when you add them all up, the record, the roster construction, all of that, the asset management, at the end of the day, it, it was time for a change. It was probably a tire, time for a change for Troy Weaver. We can move forward. And we have Rich on to talk about, yeah, that two with one star was <laughs> exciting. <laughs> To talk about the future and Trajan Langdon and this NBA draft, because at the end of the day, the Pistons do have the number five pick, and there's a lot of different guys to talk about. So before we get into them specifically, Dax Hoops asks, Rich, for the Pistons pick, assuming Saar, Reese Shea, Reed, Shepard, and Castle are gone, is there even a pick that makes sense in your mind given the Pistons roster construction? So I think maybe for you, this will give away if you have a favorite outside of one of those guys, and then we'll get into the Reese Shea wings and and on on down the line. Yeah, that's a that's a fantastic question. That comes with so many different like loaded just follow-ups, right? Where if you take Nicole Topic, who is probably the best player at this point, or Dillingham, one of those two, you have to move Jaden Ivey, right? That's probably the logical following move, sub- subsequent move. Same thing as if you take Donovan Klingon. You cannot have him and uh, Jalen Duran next to each other the whole time. Like that just won't work. So I think that has to come with a loaded kind of, okay, if this happens, you have to move one of those guys. And if that is the case, I I would swing for the fences, honestly, and go with Rob Dillingham. I think Topic has a little bit better of a floor and also better size. So I kind of see both of those. I really think one of those two guards that would be the pick. Okay, so let's let's change up here just a little bit from the outline that that Wes had for us. I didn't share this with you, but we were going to go positionally anyway. So Wes, I think this would be, let's just go ahead and go into the guards mold. And let's start there because we didn't have Rob Dillingham on the list. So Dillingham is a guy I'm a little bit lower on. Sounds like it's a guy you're, you're a little bit higher on. So tell us about Rob Dillingham why you maybe are a little more excited about him than me necessarily and how he could fit with this Pistons team, even if that meant moving on from a Jaden Ivey. Yeah, let's just start with the the negatives. The frame is horrible. He's 6'1", 6'3", wingspan, 164 pounds. He's going to be a, an atrocious defender. The hope is with him is that he's going to be an outstanding ball handler and just shot creator, three-level scorer. And being in a three-guard system at Kentucky, I think that is a very attainable thing that was hidden, where I think if he went somewhere else where he was the man, he gets a lot more volume and same efficiency. So I think that is something where you can buy into the offense. I see why you are skeptical. It's also why I would consider top pitch too, though, is because he may not be a great defender, but he's gonna he's got the size to make up for it, right? We see this all the time. The bigger you are, the more margin for error you have. But with Dillingham, I just see somebody who's a safe 20-plus points per game guy. The only downside, again, is that size. Like the NBA continues to get bigger. The average size this year was 6'4". Doing him 6'1", and his wingspan is near 6'4". So it comes with a lot of risk, a lot of reward. Richard. I'm, I'm going for Richard now because I started off with Richard. Did I mess up? <laughs> oh, oh, real, real, hold on real quick. Yeah. I feel like I'm in trouble now. <laughs> Jack Soup says Trey Young type ceiling. And then Amari, See, then we'll go to you. I, yeah. I don't think it's Trey Young. I feel like it's like Darius Garland with sure. better yeah. decision making. So I was going to ask, well, a bit along the lines of that, you know, I think there's probably some skepticism on Dillingham anyway, just because of the finishing and his lack of size. And, you know, I don't know if the combine necessarily helped him in, in, in those categories. Do you see 
I guess, where are you on him defensively and the extent that his lack of defense will hurt teams? Is it just if a team has a good run protector, you can live with it? Like if you're the San Antonio Spurs, or can you draft him onto a team that doesn't already have that support structure and still feel pretty good about building around him? Yeah, I think you have to have a pretty strong infrastructure personally. Yeah. Like the Spurs are the lone exception. Also, like Devin Vassell, while he wasn't a great defender this last mm-hmm. year, like he still is a good defender. It, I think, is something that will come back. So they have Vassell and Wemby, so they have two layers behind him or next to him. So I think you kind of need that similar thing to happen. All right, let's move on to some of the other guards here. And let's just go with this teammate. Reed Shepard is a really interesting name and a guy that, you know, I think a lot of people is feel like won't be there at five. I think in that, you know, initial question or whatever, he was already off the board. But Richard, give us your thoughts on Reed Shepard, who he is as a player, what, you know, you... Do you have him higher than Dillingham, lower than Dillingham? Does he does he make more sense with the Pistons? What are your thoughts on Reed Shepard? Yeah, I have Reed Shepard safely my top Kentucky prospect. He's my number three prospect. Look, you don't find that combination of freshman who is an elite, elite shooter, even if he overachieved, which he did, at 52% from three. Most guys overachieve at like 45%. So that mark like puts his floor that much higher. And also, he's just a ridiculous defensive playmaker. Like, However it translates, the guy finds a way to impact games on the defensive end. How how impactful? Unsure, because he's not a good on-ball defender. But I just think that combination of just really good smarts and intelligence plus high-end shooting with an elite skill. I also feel like same thing as Dillingham, right? Where we talked about it's a three-guard system. Dillingham was one of them. Antonio Reeves, the other, and Shepard. That is a great combination. Like I, I feel like he showed so much just with that combo and untapped playmaking potential. When you look at how these guys fit with Cut Cunningham, so let's say the Pistons take Reed Shepard at five. Do you see Shepard as a guy who you was probably better off playing off of a guy like Cade? Or do you see yeah. him perhaps transitioning more to a primary playmaking role in the NBA? Or can he do both? I wouldn't want him to be a primary okay. playmaker personally. I'd want him to be that guy who, if needed, he could be, you know, give Cade a playoff kind of guy every once in every, like, I don't know, five to however number. You want to put there every so often plays, but he plays off of Cade really well. And Cade's what six, I don't, he was. I know he's listed at like six seven in the draft, but he yeah. I feel like he's gotten six, shorter. Six. Than, he's yeah, six, he's like six five six six. six. Yeah, you can live with that, and also having a star next to him too. Like you have the length around it, Reed Shepard to make up for it, and that's the important thing. You can't go with another small guard. That is like like he would not work with Jaden Ivey, for example. So do you almost see Reed as like like to me the comparison I keep going back to is Desmond Bain. I know Bain is bigger, but like, do you see that that parallel? And obviously, Bane can kind of do the duo row down in Memphis with Ja. I I do. They also almost have the same wingspan. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, Desmond Bain. You are big I, on Desmond Bain too. Yeah. Like this is that's yeah. one of your biggest. That is my biggest fans, thing, I think. right? Like yeah. I, yeah, I, I had him two years three left. <laughs> I had him two years before he came out, so I, I was right. pretty happy about that. Like the right, Reed Shepard has a lot of the same things. So it's it, it, I think Desmond's better. Like, just knowing what we know now, too. Desmond was able to be a point guard when needed, but it wasn't the flashy kind of stuff that a point guard does. With Reed, it's not far off where it's, okay, if you need to go go to the middle and make a play to either the corners, Cotter, whoever it is, for himself, he could do it. I think Desmond was just better at it. He was more polished. But when you get that same kind of caliber prospect as a freshman compared to a senior, pretty appealing. Like, I think he can fit in with just about any positive lineup. Again, just not like, I don't know if he works with the lineup with Jaden and Cade in the same one, you know. Real quick before we move on to another player, you mentioned kind of the point of attack on ball defense. Is it bad? Is it neutral? I don't think either of us or any of us think it's a, a net positive. I think the the defensive advantage is how quick he is with his hands and contesting jumpers and the disruption in that way. Like, what kind of matchups is he going to be able to take on the ball and stay in front of guys, do you think? Yeah, I think one, he can only primarily guard point guards. Uh, really, anybody under 6'5", I'd be pretty uncomfortable after that. I don't think he's going to be a good on-ball defender. I think still the best outcome for him is a neutral defensive player, like where he can turn force turnovers on the defensive end off-ball, not be a massive liability on-ball. That's the best-case scenario to me. No doubt. Who's the last guard? Topich. Yeah, let's. you brought up Topich yeah. earlier, Richard. What yeah. are your thoughts on him? Because you mentioned, you know, maybe he would have been the best player on your board in the scenario that we got asked yep. about. 
again, this is the most on-ball guy probably that we have talked about. Where are you at? We haven't talked a ton about Topic because I don't, I personally don't think he's a great fit. So give us your scout on Topic first and then maybe how that would blend with Cade Cunningham and the Pistons. Yeah, so he doesn't even turn 19 until a couple months after the draft. So something to keep in mind there, he's pretty young. He's very comfortable driving and finishing with both hands. I think he has pretty good shooting touch, but the jump shot is very far away. It's a very line drive. It's just not that consistent, especially in terms of makes, but also some mechanics too. Um, Just ball comes out a little bit flat. It's a line drive. So I don't know. That stuff worries me. And then also he's not that, he, he's not like a functional athlete. I feel like in terms of like in traffic, it disappears on him. So there's those concerns. He's had been injured on and off all year. I don't know how much that actually matters, but he is somebody with size. He's the tallest player of the bunch. He can get to the rim. He can finish at the rim. He is probably the closest to a true point guard of the three. I feel like Topish is a pretty interesting case study on, I guess, the quote unquote touch argument for players where you look at the way he can finish at the rim and he's might be the best at rim finisher among guards yep. in this draft. And he could also really, really hit free throws. You know, it just doesn't ex- extend really behind the, the uh, free throw line, his range. But does that give you more confidence or are you more so looking at a guy's mechanics as far as that rather than their at rim and free throw percentages? I've, st- I've, I don't know, man, Ben Mathelmore kind of left, changes the way I view shooting. I mean, he had the prettiest <laughs> jump shot. Everybody will tell you, like, yeah. the prettiest shot you've ever seen. But it never went in. So I yeah. guess how much does it matter if you don't have that shooting touch? I would take the touch over anything. I trust free throw percentage first. The mechanics still need to be ironed out. I don't think it means, you know, don't change it. But it's at least a foundation to say he probably will be able to shoot one day. All right, let's go to a couple of questions here. First from Scoot, can we assume the Reed and Castle won't be available? So what are your thoughts? Like, we'll just talk big picture here before we get to some of the wings and bigger players that I think really are more interesting to Pistons fans in, in, in a way. What do you think? You know, is Reed going to go top four? Is Seth Castle going to go top four? I think Reed is certainly top four. I, I'm pretty sold on that idea. Castle's tough because of the way he's doing all this stuff with I don't want to work out for a team that has a point guard. But, like, he might be great for San Antonio. I, I go back and forth on that. I'd say he's a 50-50 chance. And then one more here from Dax Hoops before we go to a break. How do you think teams view the reasoning some guys in the top 10 came off the bench? So, obviously, Reed Shepard and Dillingham both came off the bench at Kentucky. Saar is a completely different context, right, because he was playing in the NBL. But h- how do you... Let's start with the two Kentucky guards. Why do you think Calabari never ended up starting those two guys? I I don't know. I've, I actually really just don't have a reason. I've thought about this too, and I was like, maybe it was to get them a little bit of matchup favors, like catch some of these guys that when they're at the end of their other minutes on the opposite side. But also, I feel like Kentucky, he, Calipari just always had this weird way with all the Kentucky guards where he would hide something about them, and then they would explode in the NBA. I mean, Bam Adebayo was, had guard skills we never saw at Kentucky, right? Not the same thing, but I think it's just more of a Calipari like quirk more than anything. Um, Shepard, I, I feel like his game is perfect as a six man, at least in college. And then, of course, Saar, like I said, was playing over in the NBL. So I, I think that's one thing we have to remember with some of these guys as well. Like, even if you just look at Saar's raw numbers, his minutes are way less than a lot of the guys we're talking about. And and we've seen guys like, like what Marvin Williams was a six man on that North Carolina team many years ago. And and so, like, we've seen guys... Russell come Westbrook, up, right? Yeah, Tari so yeah. Tar Eason, yeah, Tar Eason. So, like, the, there are there are times this has happened, and so it, it will be interesting. We are going to go to a short break here. When we come back, we'll get into some of the bigger players. Amari will lead us off with Dalton Connect. We'll talk about Zach Reese, Holland, Williams, Tin John Saloon, Wes's guy, and then we'll get to some of the bigger guys at the end. But we'll start off with Dalton Connect after the short break. All right, we are back with segment two, and we are going to lead off with one of the best peer scorers in this draft, uh, Rich Richard. Where are you? Uh, do, how high or high low are you on Dalton Connect? I'm very high on Dalton Connect. Actually, Bryce is the one who got me into him. I was like, okay, yeah, he's a good transfer. I liked him in Northern Colorado, but Bryce like really sold me. So I I just buy the offense. I don't care about the defensive negativities as long as he lands on the right team. 
the guy can do everything on offense as, as, as you'd like for a guy labeled off ball, right? He can attack closeouts, probably is able to get anywhere within two to three dribbles. You don't want him being an isolation wing, but he is somebody that like embodies that ideal current off ball wing. How, how high is the upside as a score? Like, let's leave the defense alone and the rebounding and creation and stuff like that. Like, what is the role? One guy I've kind of thought about, and this doesn't age well because he's completely out of the rotation in the playoffs now, but early in this year, when Tim Hardaway Jr. was coming in and just being a nuclear scorer for the Mavs, I was like, oh, this is the role for Dalton Connect. Find a team where you can come in and on the wing and just get bucked. Do you think Connect is a three-level bucket getter? Is he just an off-ball catch-and-shoot guy? Like, what do you think the upside is as a scorer? Yeah, he's three level. How much that mid range comes around, I think, depends on how good he develops on ball. Um, but I think it, the rim stuff is very real. He's, uh, I, for whatever reason, I, I think I might know why, but like people really underestimate him as a, an athletic finisher. Yeah. And he is, he can get up there. Like he can finish in traffic. He has great touch. I think all of that is going to translate. I agree with the Hardaway take. I mean, he's a guy who averaged 17, 18 points a game before coming to Dallas where, his role was minimized next playing next to Luca. Like he is somebody that flirted with 20 points every single night. You mentioned his defense briefly. Can you break down his defense? Like I know that's considered to be the, the weaker part of the floor for him, but exactly where is he on that end? Yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he is always getting blown by. Yeah. Uh, I don't think he really does a good job in making himself bigger against guys. Um, like I, I just don't think he really intimidates a lot of people when he's defending. Like he doesn't make their lives harder, right? I also just don't think his hips are that fluid. Change of direction really shakes him. So the on-ball stuff really worries me. And also he needs to just get stronger. Yeah, his hip fluidity seems to be an issue. And, you know, when you talk about a 23-year-old who's had time to work on that. But again, I, every time I talk about Dalton Connect, I come back to the same stuff. The path it took to get here, his development hasn't been the same as some other dude who's been five years of high-level Division One. And I want to get your thoughts just on this in general, Richard, in terms of he went to Tennessee to become a better defender, but at the end of the day, he ended up having to take crazy offensive usage. Like that's not how Tennessee wants to play offense usually is give the guy the ball and go get buckets. I don't know how much energy he had left for the defensive end. So how much do you, how much you weight do you give that in general when you're evaluating some of these guys in terms of, hey, the defense may be better when the offensive usage isn't so much. And do you think it played in with connect at Tennessee? Yeah, definitely. I, I think a lot of these high usage guys where they are the star, I mean, he was the SEC player of the year. It's hard to, I don't know, when you hear that offensively oriented, you're like you said, you just don't have the energy when, especially when you're playing over 35 minutes a game. Like, it's just hard to come across that. Like in the NBA, you're not, your usage is going to be half of what it was at Tennessee for Dalton, I think. And or may not have, like, you know, it's reduced. He's going to have way more opportunities to be well rested, getting isolation reps right on defense. If you're the Pistons, can you, I guess, to what extent can you justify taking a player with that fifth pick who doesn't add on defense? I mean, they're a 14-win team. They need everything. So it's not like, you know, he's not addressing a, a need. But I guess where are you as far as that, especially when you have guys at five who could be difference makers on defense? I, I wouldn't take him at five. I feel like you got to have someone with a little bit more two-way upside. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's just picky. And maybe Detroit's just not in position to be picky. But at the same time, I, I kind of see it if you know he's going to be better than most of the guys picked six through eight or six through nine. Why not take your guy? Again, I just kind of think I get someone with a little bit more upside. He can come in and drop 15. Like, you, you know, it's not anything to gloss over, but I don't know if it really changes the trajectory of the Pistons. And, I, and maybe that's wishful thinking in a bad class to get someone like that. I, I don't know. I'm torn on taking him at five. I'd, I'd probably lean against it. So YouTube user brings up something that was in The Athletic about players over 22 drafted in the top 20. L listen, guys, like I will, I just stand by, I'm evaluating him different than a normal 23 year old. And, and I don't want to like go through the whole thing again in his path and Juco and all that. Like, I just don't think it's the same as a lot of guys we're talking about in this, you know, in this realm of four year, five year players. So that's where I'm at with him. Maybe I will have a great learning experience here with Dalton Connect and he doesn't turn out. Let's let's talk about the guy who is at the top of, if I had a Pistons big board, Pistons wish list, whatever, I don't know that he gets to five. It sure as heck doesn't sound like he's going to. Richard, what are your thoughts on Zachary Risa Shea? I 
and go back and forth. It's really funny how different not only every single person in the draft space is on him. He's probably the most polarizing, but also just like there's a lot in the last two months when NBA beat writers where their team is getting eliminated, they start researching the draft. And a lot of these people, the first one they'll watch is Zachary Reese the shade. And I've gotten both things. I've heard, well, he's really good role player. I wouldn't take him at number one, which is probably where I fall into. And then I've also heard like, this dude sucks. Like, how is he a top five pick? So there's somewhere in between. I, I don't agree with that harsh one, but the way I see it, I would take him at five if he was there. Like you get somebody who's give or take an inch, 6'10". I, I've seen anywhere from 6'8 to 6'11". Um, I would take him because you get the size on the perimeter. On the, at least defensively, I think he's really strong, especially on off ball. Jump shot is there. Like the way he can sprint full speed into a stop and play on his feet and get, get up is quick. The footwork is inconsistent. Uh, there is one game in the playoffs where I saw him take five different threes with five different bases. That's got to change. But the fact that he's already having that much success with that gives me so much promise for how good of a shooter he'll be in the NBA. Do you have a player comp for him? I, I hate this. I, I'm yeah. bad at player comps, but I hate this one. I, I have thrown around like Jabari Smith style, not like one-to-one because Jabari protects the rim a lot better. Sure. Yeah, yeah. But that same like how you use him on offense, absolutely, with defense ability. We, wing Jabari Smith, right? Like yeah, would exactly. be... I, like had, a Trevor Ariza, maybe, or like a Cam Johnson. I like could see that, that mode. I could see Ariza, not so much okay. Johnson. I got a different Cam Johnson in this class. The uh, a scout I talked to told me French Trey Murphy, like said Trey Murphy, and so it's a pretty good outcome. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's a great outcome, and it's like, but you know, a, a floor spacer who, like, I think Trey Murphy's defense may be a little bit overrated, especially on the ball. You know, like sometimes it's like, oh, they have. Herb Jones and Trey Murphy. It's like, no, Herb Jones is a different level of defender than Trey Murphy is. I just, I think at five, Risa Shea is that three and D wing that you really, the Pistons could really use. I think he can really shoot it. And, and I see some people in here, you know, turnover to assist ratio, offensive, you know, scare, so he was an 18 year old playing in a professional league for most of the year. And so again, I'm going to weight that in some capacity as opposed to playing in a, a college basketball or whatever. Also, we're going to get some of these measurements, right? The the European combine is going on as Tomorrow. we speak or yeah. over over this next couple of days. So yeah, we're going to we're going to get some of that stuff. All right. Next guy, Ron Holland is on the list. What do you what do you think about Ron Holland in general? What do you think about Ron Holland for the Pistons? Yeah, I, I love that. I would love Ron Holland there. He's that like combination where I saw somebody put out something interesting yesterday. I forget who it was on Twitter. They're like, why when he scales down, why does he not have the chance to be like Jada McDaniels? And to me, that was such a strong okay. sell. And like, and it made sense to me. Like he's already, he plays with a ridiculous motor. He's really good on defense, has the chance to be even better, especially as he gets stronger and really just gets in an NBA environment. But I've seen him for since probably, I think 2021 was the first time I saw him. He's from Dallas, as am I. And I've seen him, I, I just feel like his athletic gifts are going to take him so far and he's added more and more skill every year. I think that eventually will get him there. And combined with a motor, if the work ethic is strong, I just don't see a way he's, he doesn't turn into like a starting caliber player. And because of that, I would take him five. I currently still have him number two because like, I haven't seen anybody else unseat him. How do you weigh, like, I think the upside with Ron, as you mentioned, is just the sheer athleticism, the, the effort, you know, the things he could do on defense. And then, you know, he's got some versatility offensively as well. Like, I think he could, he'll be able to really get to the rim in the NBA. But how do you con- contrast some of the things he was weaker in as far as playmaking? And obviously, he didn't shoot the ball well with yeah. just how much of a, a, a mess that situation was in with the G League Ignite as well. Do, do you yeah. give a guy a path a little bit more because of that? Or where are you? I, I vary from player to player because some of those guys on that team shot themselves in the foot a lot more than we talk about. But every single player on that team should get at least some benefit of the doubt because they had no point guard. London Johnson was their best point guard and he missed a lot of time and he was still, I think he's only like 19 years old. Like this is his first draft eligible year. He was with them last year. That's not okay. They did not do a good job of surrounding that talent. And I because of that, I don't think his jump shots were nearly the quality they should have been. Same with the overall shots, but... For me, I just really do buy that he can create his own look and plus the athleticism, that combination just gets me into the top five. Yeah, here's the thing, guys. So I I see a lot of people like Ron Hall and Desar can't play together. Yeah, like most of the guys the Pistons are going to have available at five aren't going to fit with the rest of the core because the core already doesn't fit together. And so, and when I say core, I'm just talking about the young guys in general. 
And then we brought up 3ND Risa and nobody liked Risa Shea either. So like the, the business have to take somebody. And if you take Ron Holland, maybe that does mean you move on from somebody or somebody comes off the bench or something like that. And in the, the day, that is this draft. And when you fall, fall to five, what is the upside of Ron Holland? Because I'm like, I will be honest. I have him higher on my board than what I usually end up getting him mocked at in a draft because the fit is a little bit tough because he doesn't necessarily shoot it overly well. But I see him as a potential, excuse me, real two-way, you know, wing who can really get buckets and then also really guard on the other end. I don't know that we've given that end of the floor enough credit for his potential to guard, the motor he plays with at his age. Again, very young player in terms of that. So what kind of the, like, do you see him potentially a two-way, right, bucket getter and defender? Easily, easily. And I think for me, it's that archetype doesn't seem to do well. Like when I put my scouting report, I put an entire section about like what makes him different from every other person in this archetype that failed. And for me, I think it comes down to one, the motor is one of the things that stood out. A lot of those guys just didn't have it. But also like he, the situation really exposed a lot more of his weaknesses. And I think if he had a point guard, for example, is finishing, he only shot like 58% of the rim. If you had a point guard to get him cuts and easier looks to really run that number up, we're talking about a whole different player and talking about a high level finisher, all this. And I think he's got the shooting touch and creativity to get his own shot up. That to me is where you look at star upside, the way he has like a nasty pullback, step back uh, between his legs jumper. I think that like having that go-to move already with the ability to add more, that's where I kind of just buy into him going into full star upside offensively. Yes, Hami is the low-end outcome for Ron Holland. Like, absolutely. And again, we could do that with every single player we've discussed, that if they don't develop this, if they don't develop that, they're going to end up in a similar outcome that we've seen from Hamadou Diallo. Billy the Kid says, maybe I'm dating myself by saying the around the world, love that game. Yes, I definitely remember playing around the world in the gym. (laughs) So yeah, you're not alone there, Billy the Kid. So Amari, more thoughts on Ron Holland, or we got Cody Williams and Tin John Saloon we need to get to as well. Yeah, I do have a a follow-up on uh, Ron. Uh, If you're the Pistons, obviously you could use his defense, but you just drafted a star last year. You're still not shooting the ball well. Do you does fit come into question at all with the Pistons, or does his upside just completely outweigh that? I I think when when you have the season the Pistons just had, I don't think you can say fit. We know one to two players on this team that are guaranteed to be like cornerstones. I, I would roll with anything that surrounds Cade. Figure out the rest after. I mean, and that's, that's, I guess that's where I'm at, where just draft the guy that you think is best and then make the tertiary. I don't think you can keep all these young guys and develop them anyway. Even if you find the perfect one, even if it is Risa Shea, do you have enough minutes to go around for the young guys plus some vets that are actually going to make you better? Like, what are you going to do with 60 whatever million dollars? And, you know, if all you're going to do is play young guys. So I would be shocked. I think Langdon will come in between the four or five that are already on the roster and this pick, he's going to choose Cade plus one or two others and then build it out from there. So I think it's, I, I think we're probably, I even, I get caught in this as well. Like I, I will admit, I get, you know, Holland doesn't shoot it that well. Steph Castle doesn't shoot it that well. But if you think Holland has real upside, I think he can still make sense. I want to talk about the other two guys we've mentioned. Then we'll get to the bigs. We have a few bigs we can talk about. And then we'll just kind of go. We had some questions, maybe some second round guys. So if you guys have questions, drop them in the chat. We'll get to them at the very end. Richard, your thoughts on Cody Williams? I'm a little bit lower on him. I wouldn't have him in play at five. What are your thoughts? Yeah, hard pass. I, I, I've i done a research on like, I mean, the advanced stats queries, right? If you put somebody in his size, the production level, that's really it as a freshman. The guys who came out in that range were Troy Brown, Cam Reddish, Jalen Brown, who's an outlier severely to this entire archetype, and then Mo Harkless, and then also Zaire Williams. So like that group is very alarming. Like I just did box plus minus six, six to six, nine freshmen. That was it. And that was it. That was the only drafted players, first round drafted players, excuse me, that were basically similar to Cody Williams. It's not a good bunch. I'm just skeptical. I don't think he's very good at like processing speed, but I think the defensive upside might keep him in the league for a little bit. Real quick, Amari, Derek Brooks asked an interesting question going back to Holland. Are you aware of this at all? I know that this was your area at one time. Do you know of any crossover between those two guys? I think okay. they're I think they're too far apart. Also, Cade left Dallas in like 2019. So because he went to Montfort. So I, yeah. I think that's 
I think it's a little bit off, but they probably would be able to bond quickly. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I thought it was like it was a great call by Derek there. So I appreciate it. But I, I, I didn't know either. So go ahead, Amari. Yeah, for sure. When you look at Obviously, I think the connection, well, his his brother, Jalen Williams, it seems like that gets mentioned a lot when you talk about Cody. How much do you think that connection has maybe boosted his draft stock and teams are trying to avoid missing the next Jalen Williams? Yeah, I I don't think his stock would be as good if his brother was a fringe NBA player. Yeah. So I, I think that plays a big role into it. No doubt. Yeah, I mean, he, he would have to fill out his body the way Jalen looks. And like, it just yeah. like, maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. But like, that's a huge aspect of Jalen Williams game. Yeah. So Richard says, weighs 47 pounds less than his brother. You know, I listen, I always like to give this caveat when I talk about Cody Williams. I've had someone close tell me like, hey, the the nose injury, the ankle injury, all of these stuff really weighed on his season. Like it was a factor into his season and, you know, just take that into account. So that that's that's all I want to say. Like is there there are people, uh, before we move on, Scoot says, this podcast is make me think maybe you should trade back. It feels like it traps you who will be picked in what order from five to 10. Yes, right, Richard, if they can. And here's what I will say. Me and Sam talked about this. There's a chance that somebody falls in love with one of these guys we've talked about, and maybe you could trade back, right? I, I don't know specifically the team. Maybe Memphis wants to move up. I don't remember in the earlier thing. Yeah, I Klingen. assume, yeah. yeah, maybe Klingon was already off the board in that one. But if Klingon's still there, maybe they want to move up and take him. Then you can trade back to eight or nine, wherever they're at, and, and try to get connect there or something like that. So absolutely, but you got to find a team that wants to move up. So go ahead, Amari. Yeah, 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 we have a, a couple of minutes. Where are you with Sub, Saloon? I mean, I think his draft stock's been all across the the board. Do you see him at play with the Pistons and what do you like or dislike? Real quick, Richard, you, Wes does have, Wes like, loves like oh, I know he, he does. Has, Wes has the ability, oh, I know he, does. he has the ability to mute you, kick you out, yeah. never invite you back on all of these things. Like, just get rid of the podcast altogether. So take this one with kid gloves or we may never see you again on the kids. No. I think he's the greatest prospect of all time. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, I think. No, there's there's real concerns. I, I think oh, some of it has to do with why, like, why he's rising. I don't think this would happen in a normal draft. I think we're trying to find, like, how often have we heard, oh, it's a bad class. But even in 2013, the last really bad class like this, there was Giannis, there was Gobert. So everybody's trying to find this, like, international mystery guy who could be Giannis, right? And I just, I, I think that's a poor lens to look at it from. And I think that is where, like, from a media perspective, a lot of people are drawing that. Now, there are real scouting elements that make you say, okay, this is impressive. Uh, I think he was born on the exact same day, if my notes are right, as Nikola Topic, uh, which is kind of interesting, but at least they're both August birthdays. They're very young, 19, 19 after the draft. So there's a lot of appeal with that. He's extremely athletic. He's about 6'8", give or take. It's a good size, athletic. The shot has grown a ton. He was somebody who I had on my radar last year, but I was like, I can't even scout this guy until he gets a jump shot. Now he has that jump shot. He moves off ball well. I think he's pretty smart for somebody who's so raw, but he's raw. So the jump shot is still very far away. He plays out of control. A lot of times he'll force up some horrible shots. I don't know how he gets away with on a pro team in Europe, but also the one-on-one defense everything is wrong. The technique is terrible. So you have to teach him a lot of how to play basketball. How quickly all that comes together and gets fixed, that's a big question mark. I would not take him at five. I think that Spurs pick at eight is about as much of a lock as there is in the top 10. YouTube user says he lacks a athletic ability in traffic currently. Could not agree more. Me yeah. and Sam actually just broke his film down for like 30 minutes yesterday, I guess it was. So you can go catch that if you guys are want to see more on Saloon. And it was something we talked a lot about. Like there's just not the vertical pop other than in Open transition yep. where he is a real difference maker or if he cuts on the baseline and nobody else is really around. So oh, oh the OG Omari has a question. Rich, about Cody Williams, did you add brother of a current NBA player to your formula? So is that something you considered whenever you were, whenever you're scouting? Like, what is the pedigree? How do you equate pedigree at all? Do you consider it all when you're looking? Because, you know, Cody Williams isn't the only player we've seen that had a brother in the NBA. Yeah, I mean, Taylor Griffin didn't have a career and his brother is Blake. So I, I don't really factor it in that much. Because, like, personally, unless I have the intel and direct access to all of this, I, I don't, like, from afar, I'm just kind of treating him as any other guy. That's personally where I where my head's at. 
Okay, we're going to go a short break. Amari, when we come back, let's get to some of the bigger players. And we'll start with the biggest of that group in Donovan Klingon. All right, back with segment three. This is another one of my favorite guys in the, the uh, draft. Donovan Klinga, where are you on him as a prospect? I love his game. I have him number four. I don't care that he can't shoot. I also don't care that he shot well at the combine because that doesn't mean anything to me. We have a whole season of sample size. The jump shot looks good. It's cool. But I, what's up? No, I just, we had a whole phone conversation about this. And yes. I like, I ran into you about just, like, why are we just saying he's going to become Brooke Lopez? Why do we continue to do this? Yeah, and I think the way I took it was he's not going to become a shooter. Like, please hit the brakes. He's a 57% free throw shooter. If anything, if there was anything in indicators of upside, it was that, hey, that free throw shot could easily come up to like league average or for a center, I should say, like close to 70%. That's as far as I would go as my sweeping takeaway. I don't think he'll ever be stretching the floor because... How many times, I mean, even Gobert shot threes in the European, uh, what was it, the FIBA last year, I think. Like, it just doesn't mean anything. But with Klingon, he controls the paint. He makes everyone around him better on both ends. He's a really, really smart player with a ball in his hands. Like, the fact that he had a two-to-one assist to turnover ratio blew my mind. Because a lot of these bigs, they really struggle with turnovers, whether it's loose balls, bad decisions, bad handoffs. He doesn't have any of that. He's extremely polished. And personally, I think I would take him in the top five if I had another center I'm not completely sold on. Do you see him being a, a plus rim protector from day one? I mean, you watch him in the tournament throughout the season. That, that's, I mean, he's already dominant. Yeah, he's just so smart. Like the way he can take two on ones in the, in the paint, I think he wins those so often that I'm pretty confident he could be a day one kind of guy. Now, there'll, be, there'll obviously be learning curves, but I think, yeah. Mike says, would you replace Duran with Klingon? So let's say, let's just, let's live in this world. We've talked about, you know, a lot of the guys we talked about have overlapped with other guys on the roster. Any big we talk about, this is going to be a question. Personally, Richard, I don't think it des- necessarily means the end of Jalen Duran because the minutes that Klingon is going to be able to play as a rookie, you've seen this with Derek Lively playing with another big. Do you think that like them playing, you know, sharing 48 minutes is something or do you think like, nope, let's get rid of Duran and it's just Klingon's world? Yeah, I mean, I, I think... I don't see an issue playing them one year in the same roster. Like you said, with Lively and Gafford, like the Mavs have made it work beautifully. You could put, Dern play just under 30 minutes a game, if I'm not mistaken. Klingon can play the other 20, right? Like let him do that his rookie year and then let him eat those minutes the next year. And maybe then you move Dern. But I've never understood personally, like I get Dern had some really, really concerning stuff with feel for the game and motor at times this year. But why Why is the there such a, like, we need to move on from during kind of approach? Because just from an outsider, I'm curious. I never saw it. The yeah. defense. Yeah, yeah. I think it's just, you know, people are lower on his defense. But it seems like you're more yeah. along the lines of he's so young that yeah. maybe he can pick some things up. I don't think he's a final product, like a finished product. That's my thing. Like, I, I understand when he was bad. Like, there were games where he completely disappeared. I saw that. But is that a permanent thing? And I, I just don't think it is. I wouldn't. I would give it one year, give him a little fire under him to see what happens. And how do you project defensive growth? I think that's maybe, you know, the area where there's been a lot of debate or disagreement. You see, like Derek Lively, he clearly had the tools and instincts in in college to be a good run protector. And he figured it out probably quicker than anybody could have guessed. But it's not like it came out of nowhere. He was doing some of those things in college. Okay, guys like Evan Mobley, Dick Claxton, those guys came in and clearly had some sort of defensive baseline. If a guy hasn't shown that, I guess... Do you just look at their their tools or what gives you any confidence that they can figure it out? Yeah, a lot of it's that feel for the game, right? Like there are so many different examples of him having two on one in the paint where the guy dumps off and he quickly turns and comp- and fundamentally blocks just not necessarily the shot, but blocks off the def- the guy with the ball who's about to go out the shooter. That That is huge. That kind of stuff where it's consistent flashes. Also, I really like the guys who don't have to camp in the paint to make a defensive impact because Klingon didn't. He hung around the paint a lot. Because in college, there's no defensive three. Zach Eady, for example, lived in the paint. He never left the paint unless he really had to. Klingon did a really good job of being around the paint a lot, but never truly camped in the paint and exploiting the rule. And to me, I think that's why he's going to translate up pretty quickly on the defensive end. K 
Can you just quickly give the why Donovan Klingon is higher and ranked higher and getting more love than Zach Eady? Because I think it's real easy for people to just go, oh, same player. Yeah. Uh, one thing I would say is Zach Eady had the same blocks per 100 possession as Deron Holmes. And he is seven foot four and sits in the paint the entire time. That's a big thing. He didn't actually dominate the defensive end quite like you would think someone as big as him did. And also, we just don't know how his mobility is going to hold up against NBA players. Like he can be easily shaken off of hesitation moves and in and outs. Like any crossover in isolation, he's going to get burned. We also just don't know how much his floor spacing translates. So if he's just an at the rim big, he might be a glorified Boban, which That's isn't necessarily like bad. Yeah, let's stick with 80 for a minute because I know that there's, you know, people who really, really put a lot of stock into college production. You see 80s range anywhere from like back of the lottery or like in the lottery really through the rest of the first round. Like, how do you see him fitting in off- offensively? And even even if the defense isn't there, do you think he can translate offensively and still kind of dominate in the way he did in college? I think he is going to be better in a lot of different ways. He won't be better offensively because his stats were just ridiculous. Well, right? yeah, yeah. But he will be better, more well-rounded than he was in college because he never had to, he had never had any reason to even go to the free throw line and shoot jumpers because you're seven foot four, you're in college and you're bigger than every single player out there. In the NBA, he's going to have to adjust. He shot really well at the combine. He is somebody where I think that says, okay, the free throw percentage is there, 74% from the line on extremely high volume. For a seven foot four guy, you could probably shoot mid range jumpers the way Brooke Lopez did. And, and, you know, I hate throwing out Brooke Lopez's name. So that's not what he's going to end up being. But he is somebody that went from like mid range jump shooter to eventual three point shooter. Like just looking at that, that part seems attainable. And to me, that's where he would have to be able to do that to be, even if it's one attempt a game from three, that's going to be the only way he returns lottery value. Billy the Kid says, you know, Edie was quicker than Klingon the combine. And so I want to use that as a question for you, because here's what I was, my immediate answer or response to that is, I don't see that on the floor practically at all whenever I watch games this year. But you were at the combine. You got to see these guys. I guess, so my first question is, what are your thoughts on what do you take away when you're there? What are you actually looking for? Because I think the numbers can be deceiving. You know, I mean, it's even, you know, we talked about Reed Shepard earlier. I think everybody would say that he Gator armed it a little bit to make his vertical leap look better. And so there is a way to cheat some of these drills. But how do you use those numbers and measurements and what you saw there and then what you watched all year with the game tape? Yeah, I value the game tape just so much more. To me, some of it's like, okay, we knew Klingon wasn't the fastest guy in the world. He uses a lot of long strides to get to where he needs to be rather than pure quickness. But Edie also has a less standing, lower standing reach despite being taller. Kind of the same thing. He probably tanked it a little bit. Momar, you were there though too. I don't know if you were on that side by the agility testing where Zach Eady went because that was the loudest running I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> I've heard a story yeah. about like Mike Trout when he was running the bases. Like this is more in his prime where he sounded like a freight train. You'd hear him huffing and puffing coming at you about to slide into second. And second base would be like, I'm getting out of the way. I'm not even going to try this. Then Eady was kind of that same thing. I was like, who was like banging on the top of interest arena and it was just Edie's like it it sounded so loud so I actually do think there is something there with like you know he can move quickly but those numbers don't and those drills just don't necessarily equate to lateral quickness in game right the functional can you stay in front of somebody one-on-one when they're changing directions with a quick first step how do you handle that those drills just don't do it that's why the game tape is so important Let's talk about Matis Buzilis. We have about 10 minutes left. The other G League Ignite guy, he's somebody that's been commonly mocked to the Pistons at five. <laughs> I know are you. Yeah, not just because of, you know, I think the positional fit, but also people talk about, you know, the Asian connection with Arn, which I don't think is going to factor in at all. But overall, like, do you give him the same benefit of the doubt Ron Allen gets? Or just where are you with uh, Buzilis overall? So I'll preface this. Price is... Perhaps he's been making a face for the last 30 seconds since you brought that up. I called him one night and I was like, dude, I do not understand it with Buzelis. How is this guy here? And I think I accidentally pushed Matas. Yeah, that is true. He is 90% every single mock I've seen Detroit too. But I, I told Bryce, I'm pretty sure he lowered him a few spots because of what I told him. But the awareness is really bad. That was the difference between Ron and Buzelis. And there's a few other guys on that team that have bad awareness where 
Buzelos would just miss guys all the time. Like when it was when he had to run full speed, I just think he just got complete tunnel vision. And I don't know how you fix that very quickly. That's something that I've felt just seeing the game for so long. I I don't know many guys who went from tunnel vision to great floor vision. That's a really hard trait to get. And to me, that's worrisome. And also, I just don't buy his jump shot. The indicators this year were rough. Maybe it was him transforming his shot in the middle of it because the high school stuff is good. But right now, it just looks bad. So unless that changes, I'm skeptical on him. What are your thoughts on the defense? Because I'm with you on the offense. That's what worries me a little bit is like, does he actually shoot it or not? I have major concerns. I've, I've probably talked to more people in every facet of the draft world about his jumper than any other player. And I would say I've gotten more that he's not going to shoot, especially early in his career, than he is going to be able to shoot. So I, I felt a little negative on the shot. I have come around on the defense, though, in terms of off-ball awareness, you know, low man rim protection. Even if he gets beat on the ball, he has the link to... Like, do you think he ends up being a, a impactful defender in some way? It's funny because I, I think wingspan is so important. And he's pretty square. I think he had plus one or not even a full one inch further than his body, longer than his body. And that being said, he is really good on defense. though. like he keeps his guy in front of him very well. And like you said, the off ball awareness, like just watch him block those help side and weak side blocks, like those shots like that. That is really impressive. I I do think he's going to be an exception to the rule of defense because there's something to be said of having quick feet and staying in front of guys where it does not matter your wingspan. Maybe you get beat a few times because you can't contest as hard. Fine, but you do everything else up until that point. A lot of guys can't say the same. It sounds like you would probably go a different direction at five if you were the uh, Pistons. Is that correct? Yeah, I would. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, we got some questions here. Guys, we got 10 or so minutes left, and then we're going to let Richard go. So if you have any, get them in. We'll go through these as quick as we can. So from three championship drive, a Pistons podcast, is there any team in the lottery you could see the Pistons trading back with? We kind of talked about that earlier and using the later pick to take Keyshawn George. So use this as an opportunity to discuss Keyshawn George. Is he a first round pick for you? He's right there on the fringe for me. Yeah, also right there on the fringe for me. I think the first part, I could see the Oklahoma City making a move. I just feel like they're bound to trade in their chips. They have three at least first round picks next year. And while it is a stronger draft, if they find one guy they like this year, they can't. They can't keep all those guys. So I do think something like that is bound to happen where a good team that happened to be in the lottery this year makes a jump. Keyshawn George is not someone I would take in the lottery personally. I I have him end of the first. I think he's got a lot of intangibles. He plays hard. He sees the floor well. I think he has a good feel for the game. But I I don't think he's that athletic. He he tested really, really poorly. And also in-game, you can see just those concerns. He doesn't really lift. He doesn't get to the line. That's what worries me. And also, I just don't know how real the shot is. Like, because he didn't get to the line, we don't have a true sample size of free throw percentage, which is stronger indication than three-point percentage. The shot goes ridiculously high. You have to visibly, like, look up to watch his shot. I'm always skeptical of those kind of guys. I remember Chandler Hutchinson had that, where it was just ridiculously high arc. I just think that stuff's harder to control. I'm pretty skeptical on him. And also, he's 20 already, and he'll be 21 in his rookie year. Tristan Da Silva is a guy who's been pretty consistently mocked in the back half of the first round. He's a guy I personally like a lot. He seems to fit the 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 mode of the type of older prospect who teams overlook just because he's not as flashy, but can shoot it. Pretty good defender, plays the four. Where are you on Tristan Da Silva and, and sort of where would you you take him? Yeah, I love Tristan Da Silva. He, he is really somebody that's like as one of the safest floors he can pass which is a very surprisingly good passer. Like his reads on the move are just shocking. Like to me, that means he's going to attack closeouts well, where even if he gets you up in the air and he meets you, the next guy, you still are several layers deep into the problem. And he's going to expose that very well. So on top of that, though, he's a good shooter. I don't buy the defense that much. I think he's pretty stiff and needs a lot of like just technique work. But I do think he'll overall be somebody that could easily start in the NBA. Richard Buck at I'm a Jared McCain to the Pistons guy. I don't think you take Jared McCain at five, but maybe like if they traded back with the Thunder to 12 or somewhere in the late lottery, I think McCain's getting real late lottery buzz at least. Your thoughts on Jared McCain, kind of where would you feel comfortable taking that type of player? Yeah, I'd take him at 12. I think he's the best shooter, not named Reed Shepard in the class. The shot is just ridiculously pure. 
He also is underrated. He's sneaky, quick. I, I think his ability just to pump fake zoom into the rim is really impressive. So I like him. Also, that Duke team was horribly organized in a different way than it was last year, but kind of the same thing where I think there's more guard skills that are hidden. We have a question here from Harry Morose Trey back. Get, I'm going to, I don't want to, but, but Daddy, he like, I've seen him like as a, a second round, maybe back end of the first round guy. Where are you with him? Yeah, I have him. He's my final first round grade. Yeah. I, I think he's a project. The feel for the game's pretty rough. He'll make some mistakes or just not do anything uh, that he should. Like there's several times where the pass is right in front of him and he'll just get out of the way. That kind of stuff irks me, but this jump shot is really good. I, I feel like he's a high upside play being so young too. And I don't think he's 19 even yet. Big Dog Pistons, where would you be comfortable taking Cody Williams? So where, where do you have Cody at? Kind of what's your range for him right now? Uh, I'm low on Cody. I, <laughs> I I would take him in the lottery, though, still like at the end, like 11 to 14. I don't see an issue with it. It's a swing for the fences. You might miss. I don't think he's somebody you want your only first round pick to be, though. Like that is too risky for me. What about Kale Where? So talent wise, <laughs> talent wise, yeah, he's he's lottery talent. I don't buy the jump shot getting there. Okay. It, there's just so many off the court intel concerns. I'm staying away. I'll, I'll, I'll be okay if I miss on that one just because of the intel. Will J says, great show as always. So hearing this, I feel we should draft Shepard no matter what. Trade or no trade, we need shooting. Always appreciate Will J when he turns in. Dax Hoops, again, any player you'd pick as guys that are mocked high that you will think fall. So Richard, who's a guy that you're seeing mocked high or maybe you have high on your personal board that you do feel like, hey, on draft night, I wouldn't be shocked if this guy takes a fall. I mean, I mean it might be Ron Allen. Yeah, that's my answer too. It's it's such an easy answer, but like it just it is it is him. Maybe Topic. I think I think the injury might hurt. Yeah, him. yeah, I, I, and the fact I think a lot of people were really excited when he was playing with Mega, and then when he went to Red Star, it's like okay, we're gonna get a much better evaluation, and then we never got that film. And so I, I think I think he could be one as well. I've I've started to hear rumblings like he may end up closer to ten than you know top three to five like we've thought about. So. No doubt. And then this will end it with this one from Michael Brewington. Who, what do you think the Hawks should do at number one? So who's at the top of your draft work, essentially? Yeah, I got Alex Sar, trade Capella. Okay. It's kind of re- reinitiating the exact problem they had with Okongwu, though. Yeah. Give him a year. Please get off the Okongwu. Like the two person, like pick somebody. Maybe they can fit together if Okongwu becomes a floor spacer, but I would take Sar. I actually have one more for you. The Pistons do have a second round pick late in the second round. Second round picks are always up for grabs. You can trade back in. Undrafted free agents. What like give me you we don't have to like go crazy deep dives into them, but but give me a few guys, Richard, that you just think that could find their spot in a rotation eventually that are gonna be there in the second round and late in the second round. Yeah, I'll start with the shooter. Somebody just so productive and efficient in his role as a fifth starter in an NCAA team. That's Cam Spencer. I, I think he's somebody that would be really just make everybody else around him better. There's always guys like Dylan Jones, who I know you, you've you liked a lot in the past. Uh, he's the only player I've ever, that has ever been recorded to have like 30% rebound percentage and assist percentage. So if you're in advanced stats, he's a pretty unique player. And then I really like Anton Watson from Gonzaga. Okay. I think he's a pure connective four. His jump shot still needs to get there. It's grown over the years, but he is ridiculously smart, can see the floor, makes everybody else around him better. And I'm very into those kind of guys. Love it. Amari, got anything else for Richard before we let him go? I'm all set. Richard, man, thank you so much. This was perfect. We got through a ton of guys, honestly, more than what I thought we were going to. And I feel like the draft is sneaking up on us now. I know we only have a few more episodes before we, you know, get to draft night. And I know you're going to be busy. So let everybody know where they can find your content. I know you're putting out all sorts of scouts and written work, doing your mock drafts. You got podcasting, all of that stuff. Let them know where you're at. Yeah, Locked On NBA Big Board for podcasts. And then my Substack, mavsdraft.substack.com. I do scouting reports, community mocks, things like that. Rich, it's always great to have you, man. And I'll go ahead and close this out. Uh, Big thanks to our audio producer, Robin Chan, our editor-in-chief, Nicole Avery Nichols, and our sports editor, Kirkman Crawford. And big shout-out to Wes, as always. And we'll talk to you all next week.